continue our discussions on the polarographic methods of analysis and uh, we were discussing about the complex ion about uh, a metal ion complexing with a ligand x with a um, with a with p molecules and its valence its valence is b minus and we can represent the complex like mxp raised to n minus pb plus and um, this uh, compound if it dissociates to mn plus and pxb minus we can write the instability constant as shown here that is mn plus into xb ra x raised to b minus whole raised to p this p comes as the uh, as, uh, as an exponent divided by the undissociated molecule. Then we can write the equation like this m x p raised to n minus p b plus n electrons plus mercury that is the reduction process and the um, uh, complex will dissociate and get reduced to the metal and uh, forms amalgam with the mercury and the ligand will get uh, released. So, we can write for this equation E half is equal to E naught 0 0.0591 bar 1 divided by n log of k instability minus 0 0.0.0591 0 n divided by n logarithm of x raised to b minus whole raised to p. So, the here p is the coordination number of the complex ion formed and x is the complexing agent. The more stable the complex ion, more negative will be the half wave potential. Therefore, there will be a shift in the E half values by complexation. So, we can determine copper in nickel, lead etcetera. They can we can complex them with cyanide ions and hence nickel and lead can be easily determined because their instability constants will change. Now, the polarographic analysis apart from the direct reducible metal ions and complex ions can be carried out if the concentration of the analyte is of the order of about 10 raise to minus 4 to 10 raise to minus 3 moles. And the volume of the solution usually what we take in polarographic determination it varies between 2 and 25 ml. However, it is not uncommon to come across concentrations of 10 raise to minus 2 molar also and as low as 10 raise to minus 8 molar concentrations using volumes less than 1 ml. It is not very uncommon at all. Therefore, the reproducibility of the duplicate analysis becomes very important when you are operating in this large range. So, it should be preferably within plus or minus 2 percent. Now, we said that uh, the polarographic uh, solutions in which we are trying to reduce the metal ions at the merc cathode uh, mercury cathode. Uh, we were if you remember our previous discussion we had uh, passed the nitrogen through the solution to remove the dissolved oxygen. Why we do that? That is because the saturated solutions of oxygen at ambient temperature that is uh, even around room temperature etcetera in this concentration that is 2.5 into 10 raise to minus 5 molar they give two waves according to the following reactions that is oxygen can get reduced to, to um, H2O2 in presence of water and this happens in alkaline solution. And uh, if it can uh, get reduced by hydrogen ions in acidic solutions forming H2O2. So, the reduced product is always H2O2 plus 2 OH minus in the aqueous solution. This is the reason why we do not want oxygen to be present in the sample solutions. 
So, the second wave that is oxygen gives two waves, one is for uh, the reduction of uh, oxygen to hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide also can further react with two electrons to give OH minus ions. So, it has to give second wave and uh, in, in acidic medium the uh, reduction product is only water. Therefore, oxygen must be removed by passing nitrogen through the analyte. Further, a 0.005 percent gelatin also should be added to remove the appearance of the polarographic maxima that we have discussed in the last class. So, if the E half that is the decomposition potentials differ by at least 0.4 volts, you will be able to determine the elements in succession that is the if you have two or more elements to be determined then their E half should be different at least by 0.4 volts that is for univalent ions like sodium, lithium, potassium, thallium etcetera. And um, for divalent ions the E half should differ at least by 0.2 volts then they can be easily determined with sufficient clarity. Otherwise, there is a problem of overlapping of the reduction potentials. So, you will not know where exactly to stop the where exactly the first uh, element is getting reduced and the decomposition potential of the second element starts off. So, for E half which overlap each other as usual what we can do is we can complex them with uh, complexing agents and then we can try to displace them to more negative potential so that the decomposition potentials are fairly well separated. We can also use precipitation, electrolytic deep uh, deposition etcetera to advantage if the complex analysis have to be carried out and polarographic analysis is part of the total analytical program. For example, nickel and zinc we can determine in pure copper salt by dissolving in ammoniacal solutions and electrolyzed at about 0.7 volts versus saturated calomel electron. Then what we can do? We can determine the zinc and nickel as separately as complex ammoniacal solutions. So, as less as 0 0.00001 percent nickel can be determined in this way. Like this you can gauge the potential of the method to determine very small quantities even in by um, polarography. Now, how do we really do the quantitative analysis? As usual as expected what you would like to do is to determine the decomposition potential and the wave height. If the concentration is more wave height should be more and if the concentration is less wave height should be less. So, you can instead of uh, concentration you can take the standard solutions determine the wave heights and for different concentrations and plot the calibration curve of the wave heights versus the concentration. Then you can do as usual an unknown or a your sample and determine its wave height and refer it to the calibration curve. So, um, what we do normally in uh, wave height uh, concentration plots is something like this. We prepare several different standards and determine the polarograms using support maximum supporting electrolyte and maxima suppressor. Uh, it is important that we suppress the maxima continuously or in almost all the samples. Otherwise, there will be an automatic error included in the measurement of the decomposition potential. And uh, then what we do is we plot 
wave height versus concentration and determine the unknown. You can read the concentration of the unknown prepared in the same way by referring to the calibration curve. Usually bracketing technique is useful for accurate analysis. So, this is a typical plot of the constant wave height concentration plots. Here I have a blank and some concentration here. This is a theoretical um, presentation and 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 etcetera. You can see that the wave heights that is the distance between this and this and this and this and this and this they are all increasing and you can plot the wave height versus concentration curves. It is a very simple technique basically. Then we have what is known as pilot ion method. In the pilot ion method what we do is the relative diffusion currents of the ions in the same supporting electrolyte we have to recognize that they are independent of the characteristics of the capillary electrode and temperature. So, we determine the relative wave height of the unknown sample and with some standard or pilot ion added to that in known amounts and compare these with the ratio of the known amounts of the same two ions. This procedure is limited to applications with minimum of 0.2 volts difference for the ions under investigation. So, this is another second method. More details can you can read it from the standard textbooks, but I am only trying to give you different techniques. And the third one is the method of standard addition. Uh, I have to tell you at this stage that the method of standard addition is not necessarily a prerogative of the um, technique what we are discussing that is polarography. Method of standard addition can be employed even in spectrophotometric analysis or um, hydride generation or atomic absorption or ICP or any of the thing. The principle remains the same. So, I am going to explain to you the principle of the method. So, what we do is in this case as far as because we are discussing the polarography, we have to determine the polarogram of the unknown solution. That means, you determine the wave height of an unknown solution and then what you do is take the same unknown solution, add a known amount of the same ion to the same cell and record a second polarogram. That means, first you are taking the known sample and determining the polarogram as usual. Then you are taking the same amount of the solution again in another, uh, well, another uh, beaker and to that you are adding a known amount of the um, standard solution. So, I have two entities now. One entity is I 1 is the diffusion current of the unknown in volume V that is the original volume of the concentration C u let us say unknown. And I 2 is the second measurement what you have made. It is the diffusion current after a small amount of, of uh, standard solution that is small v is added corresponding to a concentration of C s. That is the second volume uh, you are adding a standard solution and determining the wave height um, current. So, we can write these two equations that is I 1 is equal to k into C u that is unknown the um, current is proportional to the concentration of the unknown with a proportionality constant of k and uh, I 2 would be also be proportional to the concentration of the unknown as well as concentration of the standard, but the volumes are different. So, I 2 would be proportional to the V that is I, am, I had designated this as capital V into C u plus small v into C s divided by k multiplied by k divided by k 
capital V plus small v that is the total volume of the solution. So, why we are getting the second equation is because it is the volume of the measurement, measurement volume is changing by the addition of the small amount of the standard solution. So, we are having two different equations and two unknowns. So, k we can solve for k is given by I 2 into V by plus V divided by V into C u plus V into C s and unknown concentration of the unknown can be determined by this simple expression I 1 into V C s divided by I 2 minus I 1 into multiplied by total volume initial volume plus standard volume added plus I 1 V. The derivation of this equation is very simple. I will not be going into the details of this derivation, but it can be found in any of the standard textbooks. So, the accuracy of the method depends upon the precision with which the two volumes of the solution and the corresponding I D that is diffusion currents are measured. They have to be very accurate, otherwise uh, there is no point in doing this uh, method, especially standard addition method volume should be exact and measurement of the diffusion current also should be exact. Here the assumption what is made is that the wave height is a linear function of the concentration in the range of concentration employed. That means, assume that it is a, a beer Lambert's law with a straight line uh, curve, we, we are by adding the unknown solution to the um, standard solution by adding the either way standard solution to the unknown solution, the total concentration would still be in the beer Lambert's law range. If it goes beyond that, we will not be able to um, determine the unknown with sufficient accuracy. So, that is one of the preconditions. And, uh, uh, we will have to be wary of this uh, condition, we have to make sure that we satisfy this condition all the time, especially when we are employing the standard deviation technique, standard addition technique. So, best results are obtained when wave height is approximately doubled, that means your unknown volume and uh, the known volume should be unknown should be uh, should be double of known volume standard addition. So, concentration should be half. So, we will uh, stop our discussion about uh, the uh, polarography, more details can be had. I have to tell you at this stage that polarography has developed into a very well defined beautiful analytical technique, especially for the separation and speciation of the elements in different uh, uh, matrices. And with respect to speciation, polarography is rather superior to atomic absorption, atomic emission etcetera, because their speciation uh, is not so easy to define, because um, the changes in the uh, valency states are not so prominent in atomic absorption or atomic emission. But um, the polarography in polarography just by speciation that is the exact composition of the metal ion as a complex in the known solution, it can represent or it can give you a, a differentiable diffusion current, which can be correlated to the chemical existence of the different species of the same element also. So, that is a an advantage why lot of people especially with variable uh, element with variable oxidation states and chemical compositions they prefer voltammetry 
polarography and anodic uh, stripping voltammetry to exactly identify the different chemical species of the element in a given matrix. So, at the now I want to turn your attention to the Carl Fisher uh, reaction. So, Carl Fisher reaction is a very beautiful <coughs> um, Carl Fisher reaction is a very beautiful way of determining the moisture content in a given sample. Suppose I give you a, any salt and you want to determine the moisture content in that. Normally, one would just heat it to about 100 or 150 degrees centigrade and uh, remove the water by evaporation and dry it and uh, put it cool it and take it to a weighing machine to determine the difference and correlate it to the concentration of the water uh, that is present in a given sample. But situation may arise when you heat it the compound may undergo different transformations it may decompose. So, in such cases you cannot weigh it and uh, if the concentration of water or moisture is in parts per million level, if it is in percentage level yes it can be done by simply weighing and noting the differences. But if it is in parts per million level, you want to determine and we do not have a simple method of quantitative determination of water in any of the samples at parts per million level. It's the only way we know of this uh, kind of analysis is Carl Fisher titration and uh, the, the beauty of it is the Carl Fisher titration can be applied to organic substances as well as inorganic substances in um, situations uh, pharmaceutical preparations where water should not be there and uh, the such uh, situations can be monitored by using Carl Fisher titrations and uh, for the determination of very small quantities of water. So, Carl Fisher is a scientist they are scientists they proposed a reagent prepared by the action of sulfur dioxide upon iodine dissolved in pyridine and methyl alcohol. So, the reaction may can be represented like this that is pyridine three molecules of the pyridine C 5 H 5 N will react with one molecule of iodine and uh, sulfur dioxide one molecule in presence of water that is if water is present then it forms a an in complex like this 2 C 5 H 5 N H plus I minus this is a salt mm, just like sodium chloride Na plus C L minus I have C 5 H 5 N H plus and I minus and then it forms a complex uh, C 5 H 5 N plus S O 2 is joining here is joined here with nitrogen SOO minus and if I add a methyl alcohol because the reaction is the, um, with methyl alcohol also the methyl alcohol will react with this charge on the oxygen forming OSO2 OCH3 that means if we ensure that one only one molecule of hydro water is reacting in this whole system and we prevent the reaction with another molecule of water by having methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol binds to this position and then it for produces an ester. So, the first step in the first step sulfur dioxide is oxidized by iodine and an intermediate compound of pyridine sulfur trioxide is formed that is it is this is the inner salt of pyridine and sulfonic acid that is uh, very easily understood this one C 5 H 5 N plus S O O minus is the inner salt of the pyridine <coughs> N sulfonic acid. The second step 
is the formation of pyridinium methyl sulphate which prevents the pyridine complex from reacting with another molecule of water or other hydrogen active compounds. Therefore, we make sure that only one molecule of iodine is equivalent and that means it is reacting and only one molecule of iodine is equivalent to one molecule of water. So, the so stoichiometry is established that 1 is to 1 stoichiometry. So, the original Carl Fischer reagent is prepared with excess of methanol which serves as a reactant as well as a diluent. This reagent is somewhat unstable when it is prepared freshly it is good, but over a period of time it decomposes and then uh, it is unstable. Therefore, what we have to do is we need to standardize the Carl Fischer reagent frequently regularly whenever you want to use any Carl Fischer reagent first step is to standardize the Carl Fischer reagent and then use the new standard value for the calculation of the water in the sample in which you are analyzing. Now, a more stable reagent can be prepared from ethylene glycol monomethyl ester that is a compound it is popularly known as methyl cellozole. There are number of uh, um, uh, mono ethyl ethers which are known as methyl cellozoles, butyl cellozoles and then carboxymethyl cellozoles etcetera, but methyl cellozole is uh, fine it works for the system. Uh, others also do work. So, freshly prepared reagent has a deep reddish brown color and the spent reagent has a pale yellow color. So, just by looking at the Carl Fischer reagent you will know whether the reagent is good enough or not. If it is having deep brown color with less yellow tinge you can say that the material is useful otherwise one has to prepare fresh reagent. So, that it can be used as a we can also use it as a uh, direct titrant that is you take di the dark brown Carl Fischer reagent and uh, titrate it in a solution containing your salt. You either dissolve the salt or suspend the salt in methyl alcohol and then titrate it directly using a uh, just like any ordinary college uh, titration from the burette take the Carl Fischer reagent and titrate it until you get a pale yellow color. So, the, but the problem is the decomposed reagent also has a slight brownish color and the endpoint detection is somewhat difficult. Therefore, what people do is we add a slight excess of the reagent and titrate the excess with a standard solution of water in methanol. So, we know how much of water we are uh, uh, we are adding and to determine how much of the Carl Fischer reagent is consumed. So, the difference is going to tell you the actual Carl Fischer reagent that has been added extra. So, it is uh, um, end point is easily determined even otherwise end point can be determined electrometrically. That means, when there is uh, when the reaction is complete you will not see any current. If a small EMF is applied across two platinum electrodes immersed in the reaction mixture a current will flow as long as free iodine is there to remove the um, hydrogen and depolarize the electrode. When the last trace of iodine is removed by reacting with the water molecule present in the sample, then what happens to the current? 
the current will decrease to 0. So, initially you will get a very high current reading and then as you keep on titrating the iodine will get consumed and the current will keep on decreasing and when the last trace of iodine is uh, removed the current will become 0 or very close to 0. So, such reactions are known as dead stop reactions. So, dead stop reactions will exactly be able to pinpoint the end point of the titration irrespective of whether you will be able to determine be able to identify the color uh, change or not. So, long as you are measuring the electric current when the moment it reaches 0 that is the end point. So, the electrometric end point for Carl Fisher uh, reagent is much more reliable and dependent for the determination of water. So, conversely what you can do is the technique may be combined with a direct titration of the sample with the Carl Fisher reagent. In this case any excess of iodine causes the current to rise sharply either you can take it in the beaker or in the burette. So, you can do either way add excess and then titrate or you can straight away titrate the substance with the Carl Fisher reagent and um, uh, any excess of iodine causes the current to rise sharply if you are adding Carl Fisher reagent extra. So, either way it is a dead stop reaction. In one case you would see a figure like this that is volume added and current. So, it keeps on increasing and otherwise in the other case what happens is it will become a dead stop reaction. So, either way you should be able to determine the end point of the reaction because there will not be either there will be either increase or no increase depending upon whether you are able to whether you are uh, how you are conducting your <coughs> experiment we are taking it in the burette or in the conical flask whichever way is you are handling. Sometimes what happens is if the sample is very costly then we do not want to waste it. So, we take a small quantity in the conical flask and take the Carl Fisher reagent from the top that is from the burette and if it is not so costly then you can uh, uh, do the normal Carl Fisher titration as usual. So, um, the technique can be used either either way, but the direct titration with the Carl Fisher reagent is a more elegant method. So, the apparatus is basically very simple, the source is a 3 volt battery it is a torch battery basically T1 2 simple torch batteries uh, with 1.5 volts output will be sufficient and what you need is a micrometer and you need a resistance with a 500 ohm resistor and 0.5 watt radio potentiometer. The potentiometer is set so that there is a potential drop of about 80 millivolts across the electrodes and does not require any adjustment until the whole battery is exhausted. So, Carl Fisher reagent may be you can uh, standardize the Carl Fisher reagent with 5 to 6 milligram of water dissolved in methanol or you can take a titrate directly with uh, uh, disodium tartrate dihydrate it is a primary standard and water content is exactly known you do not have to worry about how much of water is there and uh, this uh, because this disodium tartrate um, uh, dihydrate contains 15.66 percent of water. So, the standardization of Carl Fisher is very easy and you just have to weigh the so, disodium tartrate 
dihydrate and titrate with Carl Fischer reagent and you are ready for the actual analysis. The application of uh, Carl Fischer reagent is uh, very mm, mm, invariably employed in uh, several kinds of samples all over the world including pharmaceutical industries and uh, other uh, industries where water content in the salt is very important. Now, there are certain problems with Carl Fischer reagent. The reagent may be applied to the samples with the following requirements. What are those requirements? They should not react with the reagents or hydrogen iodide itself to yield water. You see if the one of the reaction product is water, you will never see the end point of the titration at all because more and more water get, keeps on getting produced. So, the non production of water is one of the most important aspect of this that it should not if um, the one of the reaction products is water you should not be using this method at all. Then the products the reactants and the product should be miscible with the reagent that is another requirement and preferably it should not cause precipitation of the pyridine complexes because we have already said that the mm, pyridine disulfonic acid salt it is an inner salt and uh, if that salt precipitates there is no further reaction with the methyl alcohol. So, it should not precipitate during the titration and if you are conducting a potentiometric titrations then it they will preferentially the uh, it there should be electric current should be pass passable that means the solution should be fairly dilute and uh, easy reproducibility should be obtained. So, the reagent may be used for determining water present in the hydrated salts. Most of these salts solutions what your salts what you buy in your laboratory they all have water of crystallization and the water of crystallization is, uh, is determined by titration with Carl Fischer reagents and uh, which is this is absorbed on the surface of the solids. So, uh, water may be hydrated uh, hydrated salt or sometimes the water may be just adsorbed you keep the salt open it will absorb moisture adsorb on the surface that also can be determined that means, even if the samples do not have the water of hydration, but they just absorb water from the uh, atmosphere such water also can be determined by Carl Fischer titration. It is a very rapid and direct method compared to the drying process. A sample of the powder containing 80 to 100 milligram of the water is dissolved or suspended in 25 ml of methanol why 25 means it is only a question of convenience it is a titration basically a titration procedure and um, 25 ml is a fairly good amount for titration you can manage with still less well and good and uh, you will be saving the Carl Fischer reagent and Carl Fischer reagent costs somewhere about 400 to 600 uh, uh, rupees for 500 ml. So, the mixture is basically titrated with the Carl Fischer reagent to the usual electrometric end point. An end point stable for about 15 seconds is what you should look for that indicates the complete reaction otherwise you know the end point will come again it will become brownish again you will add end point etcetera add, add the Carl Fischer reagent and there will be no end. So, the uh, idea is to for about 15 seconds if the end point is uh, color is stable straw color then the, that indicates the end of the reaction. So, the Carl Fischer reagent has been successfully applied I am giving you a small list of the chemicals 
you will see the applicability of uh, the Carl Fisher reagent, the wide applicability and popularity of the Carl Fisher reagent with respect to the following salts. You can apply them to barium, cadmium, cobalt, lead, magnesium, nickel, sodium, zinc, uranyl acetate, calcium lactate, malonate, propionates, etcetera. These are all organic salts of these metals and then sodium citrate, and then naphthionates, succinates, formaldehyde, ammonium oxalate, phosphate salts and potassium salts, chromium salts, strontium, cadmium, tin chlorides, you know chloride salts, and then nitrate salts of chromium, cobalt, mercury, etcetera and then sulphate salts of aluminum, cobalt, iron, magnesium, manganese and then nickel, zinc sulphates, etcetera. These things uh, it just goes to indicate the a variety of the salts that are um, that can be det uh, that can be um, adopted for the determination of water by Carl Fisher reagent. You can even take activated alumina and um, find out how much of the water um, is adsorbed onto that. You can take silica gel approximately 5.48 percent is uh, water is adsorbed onto that and then calcium chloride, calcium sulphate these are used as standards for Carl Fisher titration not just methanol, but the other standards are also quite possible to use the in the Carl Fisher titration. Now, if it is uh, if I am singing so much praise about Carl Fisher reagent, is it a panacea for all water analysis problems? The answer is unfortunately no. The there are problems associated with the Carl Fisher reagent that is sometimes you do come across interferences and interferences you can easily guess if you are a chemist because you will have that kind of chemical intuition, but otherwise for your uh, um, reference I have listed them in the next slide. I have the first uh, slide, uh, the next slide what is showing is oxidizing agents such as chromates, dichromates, cupric salts, ferric salts, peroxides etcetera, they interfere because they react with iodide, they oxidize iodide to the and they produce iodine. So, a simple reaction representative reaction is MnO2 and it reacts with iodide to produce manganese 2 plus followed by pyridine and iodine plus 2 water molecules. So, this is the first kind of uh, reaction where we have water as the product. So, such reactions cannot be uh, employed in Carl Fisher titration because if we are determining water we cannot be producing water by the reaction. And then we have thiosulphates, stannous chloride, sulphides etcetera these are reducing agents and they reduce iodide to iodine that is not very ideal. Then basic oxides are there zinc oxide they react with pyridine directly and get reduced to zinc and pyridine and again they produce water one of the precondition for not applying the Carl Fisher reagent. And then weak oxy acids like sodium bicarbonate they react with pyridinium ion then they produce water again not very good. And then borates react with methyl alcohol which is one of the components of the Carl Fisher reagent and uh, they produce BO CH3 thrice that is 
methyl uh, borate, methoxy borate and again they produce water, not very ideal. So, any reaction where water is uh, produced, we cannot use it for Carl Fischer reagent method to determine the amount of water that is present in a salt. Still, it does not reduce the importance of Carl Fischer uh, titration uh, because uh, the applications are much more enormous, much more complicated and um, complicated and um, applications are for more complicated salts for which there are no methods available, but that is what I meant. And uh, the Carl Fischer reagent is a fairly re good reagent. Of course, it is a dirty reagent, it smells quite uh, rotten, but um, the importance can be realized from the fact that uh, the for the invention of this Carl Fischer reagent, Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, to the inventors. Typical results, what we normally um, use in Carl Fischer reagent is shown by the next slide. That is, this um, if I use 1 ml of the Carl Fischer reagent, uh, the tide standard value is 6.66 milligram of water and volume of Carl Fischer reagent added is about 2 ml. So, excess of Carl Fischer reagent is 1.18 ml of water methanol mixture that is 0.54 ml extra excess is added. So, the tighter value is 1.46 that is from 2 ml excess is 0.54. So, tighter value is 1.46. So, 2 minus 0 0.54 is um, 2 minus 1.46 is 0.54. So, the water content can be very easily calculated using this expression 1.46 into 6.6 .6 into 100 divided by 10 into 1000 that is we directly convert the water into percentage straight away. So, that is about the Carl Fischer reagent and um, I will stop here uh, our discussions on the electrometric methods. The reason why I have introduced Carl Fischer reagent in this um, topic is because it has got an electrometric end point which is exact. So, the, you know, it would be nice if you remember this Carl Fischer reagent for your future references whenever you want to determine water of hydration, water of adsorption etcetera and um, that is the only way we know for quantitative analysis of water. So, what I would like to do now is uh, I will uh, complete our discussions on uh, this uh, electrometric methods. Of course, there are several other electrometric methods like uh, anodic stripping voltammetry and then conductometry, coulometry and high frequency titrations etcetera, but the inputs what I have given to you so far with respect to electrochemical techniques will serve as the basic uh, learning material and you will be able to graduate to other methods whenever there is a need for you to look into those other techniques and you will be able to adopt yourself very easily to other techniques whenever there is a need. So, I, I, I am going, I will uh, end our discussion on the electrometric techniques here now and we will move on to chromatographic techniques. So, the, this is an entirely different aspect uh, from uh, electrometric techniques or spectrography, spectroscopic techniques, spectrography and electrometric techniques etcetera. Chromatography is an entirely different uh, ball game together, altogether. So, uh, we need to understand that chromatographic techniques basically serve the purpose of separating 
the uh, components in a given mixture. So, with this uh, basic objective defined, I will take you to this uh, another world of chromatography and um, I would like to start off with the uh, with the title that is again in my next slide and the, this is followed by my definition of chromatography that is what I had told you the basic aim is to separate the components. So, the term chromatography embraces a family of closely related separation techniques based on the observation of Dr. Chwet and Days. They made a number of observations and experiments during 1903 to 1906. You can imagine that the chromatographic uh, techniques are not really very old. You will appreciate that they are only 100 years old now, but the amount of uh, um, amount of knowledge and um, the amount of advances that have come through in chromatographic techniques is truly enormous and mind boggling. So, the importance of chromatography lies primarily in its use as an analytical separation tool although nowadays since last uh, 15 to 20 years chromatographic techniques have been used as a production tool since last two decades especially high quality pharmaceutical products the many of them are being produced using preparative chromatography that is you not only produce you separate the components and take out the pure components and start marketing the drugs and pharmaceuticals enzymes etcetera. <coughs> it serves as a means of resolution of mixtures and also for the isolation and for partial description of the components whose presence may be known or suspected. You may be knowing all the components still you would like to separate or you may suspect that it could be contaminated etcetera and still you should be able to separate if the uh, situation so demands. In chromatography the components to be separated are distributed between a stationary phase and a mobile phase that is uh, the stationary phase will have large surface area and uh, uh, through which a liquid will pass through. It percolates through the stationary phase along the stationary bed and mass transfer between the mobile phase and the liquid phase takes place occurs either because the molecules of the mixture are absorbed or adsorbed on the particle surfaces or they are dissolved in particle pores, pores between the particles they in the liquid they are absorbed or they partition into pools of liquid held on the surfaces or within the pores. This process is known as sorption when the, when the component passing through a stationary bed dissolved in a liquid it as it passes through it may be held on to the particle size on the surface of the particle or in between the particles there will be some space and through which the liquid will percolate and um, in this liquid it may be absorbed and there will be distribution between the stationary phase as well as in the mobile phase. So, the process is known as sorption. Separation of the components in a sample is based on the fact 
that the rate of travel of individual solutes, solute molecules through a column or a thin layer of adsorbent is directly related to the partition that is how the molecule distributes itself between the two uh, stationary phase and the mobile phase and um, uh, it is uh, the between the molecule and stationary phase the molecules may get distributed and then they run through at different speeds. The partition coefficient of each component determines how much of it is in the liquid phase and how much of it is in the stationary phase. So, if selective retardation differences prevail that means, if the molecules are held selectively and they travel at different speeds, each component can travel through the column or along the stationary phase at a rate dependent upon the sorption characteristics. If the sorption is very high, the adsorption is very high that means, the uh, uh, travel would be slower via the stationary phase. Otherwise, if it is not all adsorbed, it will just run through. So, after some time what happens? Some time interval they will be distributed in space over the stationary phase. Suppose, I have a long column of, um, um, of about 2 meters, then initially they would all be in a simple mixture. After about 1, uh, one feet there will be separation and they will be running at a different speeds. So, after 2 feet there will be further separation of the components and at the end of the column they will come out individually separately. So, you can imagine the whole process like a running race. So, the fastest man who is not adsorbed will come out fast and the slowest man who is getting adsorbed and released, adsorbed and released his speed will be reduced and he will come out later but everyone will be a winner at the end. That means, all the components will be passing through the column and coming out. That means, every participant is a is able to reach the winning goal post. So, if you take a look at this slide, the after some time interval they will be distributed in space over the stationary phase and subsequently emerge out of the stationary phase as single components. Several techniques result depending upon the choice of the stationary phase and mobile phase. We can have a number of stationary phases and number of mobile phases that is how we have a number of chromatographic techniques. And in the next slide I am going to show you this. You will we will discuss what are the different types of chromatography and how we can employ them for our separation purposes.